and it's, it's fascinating, that you actually can refine your emotions to the point that certain things simply won't bother you. The things that bothered you yesterday or a while back will not concern you now. We human beings pride ourselves with our intelligence, with our minds. Look at the scientific breakthroughs, the breathtaking technologies in medicine, in every other field and area. We've conquered the universe. We've tamed the elements. We're more powerful than animals and other creatures that are far stronger than we are because of our innovation, because of our minds. And yet, there's a tremendous question that has to be answered. What is intelligence? Someone can be book smart, but have no common sense. Someone can have a high IQ, but be emotionally immature. So recently we hear about emotional intelligence, EI. You know, for, for intellectual intelligence is II, emotional intelligence is EI, and then of course there's AI, artificial intelligence, which is not the topic and scope of our discussion here. And actually one of the great challenges in AI is can we make artificial intelligence emotionally intuitive? But emotional intelligence seems to be a paradox just in its very terms. When we say emotions, it seems to be antithetical to intelligence. Just on a very basic level, our emotions are impulsive, our minds are reflective, and they clash very often, almost every moment of our lives. Your emotions can be drawn to something, can be tempted, could be even something destructive. And your mind, if it's working and functioning properly, will pause and say, one second, let's reflect on this. Is this good for you? Short-term benefits versus long-term, instant gratification versus hurting somebody, yourself or others. So when you speak about mind, you speak about reflection, introspection, self-control, discipline, emotions left on their own, raw emotions are impulsive, reflexive, reactive. And yet we see there are people who have not just brain power in the sense they can understand things well, but also have a level of human understanding. They get people. And very often, that doesn't always come together. Some of the most brilliant scientists are known for their absent-mindedness, for their carelessness, even callousness when it came to human relationships. Because the fact that a person has a high IQ, the fact that a person is brilliant or a genius, does not guarantee that their emotions are also mature. And indeed, the way the Kabbalists and the mystics put it, which is actually a very powerful psychological model that goes back literally thousands of years, that in general there are three stages of human development. And the cognitive and the emotional do work hand in hand. When you look at a newborn child, their primary way of functioning is reflexive, behavioral. That's how they're wired, impulsive. Child is hungry, it must let us know. When it's tired, when it's in pain. We don't know much about the child's consciousness because you can't interview a newborn. But a lot, much has been observed. But we do know that as months pass, the child begins to recognize things and can respond. You take two, three years, and a child does have an emotional makeup. A child can respond, can begin to speak and say thank you. Please, you can't expect that of a young child, of a newborn, to have a relationship. But the relationship begins to develop. Yes, it's still on a childish level. But as the years roll on, what you see is the emotions are developing as the mind develops. Now, in a healthy circumstance, I have to qualify that because you can also have a child growing up in an unhealthy environment, and that skews and can distort things. But in a healthy environment, what you have happening is that as they both grow together, 
the child's mind begins to regulate and in a way harness the emotions. And part of that, part of education, is doing exactly that. We're not talking about going against the emotions, but you don't just grab something from someone. You share, you show gratitude. Other behavior that we teach a child that the mind understands, still, in the younger age, that's called immaturity, the child is still controlled by its emotions. So then comes stage three, where the mind begins to actually can exert control over the emotions. Now, this doesn't mean everybody employs that uh, faculty. The fact of the matter is, yes, most adults are not going to just throw a tantrum in the public. That's because of their own shame. And they're, they're embarrassed to do that. But they could be having a tantrum within. Think of, uh, <laughs> think of um, people who um, just get insulted. Or road rage. You can be a very mature adult and a brilliant person. Someone cuts you off and you, can, and you can lose it. So an intelligent person will more or less control it. So in other words, we still can be immature emotionally, but our minds at least are controlling it. A child can't even control it. But then there's actual real maturity, where it's not just that you're in internally immature and you're just not expressing it. You're not going to get on your hands and knees and start scratching and biting like a newborn, like a young child would, but internally you may be doing that, but the mature, the mature emotions actually do mature into becoming more refined emotions. That which did not bother you when you were five years old, that which bothered you when you were five years old does not bother you now, in a real way. Not just that you subdue it or you just con conceal it. Think of a little kid coming over to you and giving you a scratch or starting to kick you. In most li likelihood, a mature adult is not going to get down on their hands and knees and start kicking back. And not even want to do that. It's not in your league. That's because your emotions have developed. This is a child. Now, if an adult may do it, you may react emotionally as well. So there are stages in this development to the point, and it's, it's fascinating, that you actually can refine your emotions to the point that certain things simply won't bother you. The things that bothered you yesterday or a while back will not concern you now. Why? Because your emotions have developed with your mind and they're commensurate to each other. It's not like your mind has grown and chronologically you're an adult, but emotionally you're still a 10 year old. Now, does this mean we're perfect? We all will have moments. Everybody has moments. Things overwhelm us. We have grief, tragedy, other things. So it's not about completely shutting down our emotions. Actually, that's not even healthy. So what do we come away from this? That initially, yes, the mind and the emotions are, can be antithetical, and, many, and very often they are. But there's also something that where they work together, like in harmony. Think of the mind as the processor, the researcher. So let's say you meet someone, you go on a date, with a, a prospective date that you perhaps want to marry but you don't know so what do you do you date you have conversations interactions you see how another person reacts and what are you doing essentially you're researching i mean i don't like that use that word in this context but that's what you're doing your mind is thinking and trying to figure out now you may be emotionally attracted or drawn to this person but a mature person is not going to just follow that because you want to know more about the person. You don't just want to know whether, you're, whether there's just a, uh, a physical or sexual attraction. You actually want to know whether this person is the right one for you. We can be attracted to a lot of things that are not necessary for us. So your mind, and again, in the healthiest circumstance, is working to looking at it. And it's through conversations, it's through discussions. You're probing I don't want to say testing, and both people, two adults, will be doing that. After a while, when your mind says, you know, this is a, a quality person, so you slowly, your, your emotional defenses slowly go down, and you open up a little more. Again, I'm barring any type of exceptions, which unfortunately today may be the rule, where we have any, a complex defense mechanisms and armor and distrust, and disappointments and fears and insecurities that may impact that. So I'm trying to just talk about something. Let's isolate that for a moment. I'm not suggesting it's not important, but just to discuss it in a more focused way. 
So what are we dealing with here? Your mind is basically telling your emotions, hey, someone worth continuing to see. And slowly, slowly, you start recognizing whether you trust this person, whether you emotionally connect. Can you be vulnerable with this person? Can you trust them? And that's far more when you want. So your mind essentially is like the captain of the ship, guiding, directing, the steward. And the emotions are the ship itself, the experience. Now, mind itself is like a computer. It can, it can crunch data, crunch numbers, and give you all kinds of conclusions, but it can't tell you I like it or I don't like it. I can say it's, you could say it's worthy to be liked. This is a person that's worthy to, perhaps, to marry. This person is worthy to have a business relationship with, if it's a business interaction. But then the actual relationship is the interaction, which is far more than the mind. And in the healthy situation, they speak to each other and work well. Now, there'll be conflicts. There'll be times where the emotions can get a hold of you and overpower your mind. That's not uncommon, as I mentioned. But that's part of the negotiation between your mind and your heart. And when they work well, you have a captain that regulates and makes sure that you're not getting yourself emotionally in a situation that may not be right for you. And the emotions are open and welcome to experience it. Now, if a person experiences fears, which is emotional, the mind should be like a scout that checks things out and tells its, the emotions, hey, you know what, I checked it out. You don't have to be that afraid. It's like sending someone ahead of you to check out the situation and, and let you know, is it worth exploring? Now, in that context, if you think of it that way, what happens now is that the emotions, once they've been guided and you have the best of your mind and you're not living in your head in mind games, now comes the other side of the coin, the emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence is far more than just intelligence. So how do we describe emotional intelligence? So let's start with the word empathy. You'll see people, I don't want to use sociopaths or psychopaths, but even people who are brilliant in their minds very often are emotionally immature. And one of the things lacking is empathy. As a matter of fact, very creative geniuses are known for their narcissism, for their selfishness. Empathy. I remember once hearing a little girl saw a pregnant mother and she said to her mother, she said, Ma, how do you have room inside yourself for another human being? And I thought about it and I said, you know, some men don't even have room for someone outside of themselves. Their egos are too big. Now, this is necessarily mutually exclusive to men or women, but often a woman does have that room because also she's emotionally, her physiological being is very much like her emotional being. That's why we often attribute emotional intelligence more to women than to men. That, again, this is not a, 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 a counter-sexist statement, but rather just an observation. But everybody can develop it because we all have the capacity. However, it's a little more complicated. Because since emotions are naturally more impulsive and therefore naturally can also be more vulnerable, so we don't always allow our emotions to really speak to us. So we hide behind our minds. An emotionally intelligent person recognizes the role of intelligence and doesn't overrate it and doesn't underrate it. In our world, the mind is frankly overrated very often academic excellence, good marks, and yeah, maybe get you a better job and you may be a better processor of ideas and therefore more creative, more innovative. And that's simply because relationships take a second fiddle to making money or to other ways we measure success. The truth is in a healthy society, the way you would measure a successful society would be how mostly intelligent people are, not how high their IQ is and their aptitude, but rather a certain combination of empathy, I would also say intuition, but above all, and here's where the paradox is so profound, though the mind seemingly is more objective than the, than the emotions, than the heart, and it is, because the mind should be detached, as I said, reflective. It does not let your subjective impulses to take a hold of you. But once the mind has helped the emotions grow, as I described at length, and that's why I elaborated, now the emotions come to a point where they can be in some ways 
I'm not going to use the word objective, but they can have more humility even than the mind. But only after they've been trained, after they've grown. So initially, emotions are completely about you, my feelings about something. What does it mean for me? That's what an emotion is. Healthy intellect doesn't ask about me. Intellect will say, this is, this is the facts on the ground. This is what it is, this is what it's not. You don't bring yourself into, you don't insert yourself into the equation. Emotions always insert yourself. I feel this, I like it, I'm attracted, I'm repelled. The mind can say this is something that's worth being attracted to. But it's the emotions that actually have the attraction. But once emotions develop, and now we're talking about emotional intelligence, what they offer is something where you can actually say to yourself, mind and emotions working together, you know, I'm not going to insert myself. I want to listen to another person. Is that an intellectual statement or is that an emotional one? Empathy. The truth is it's a combination of both. And that's why we can call it emotional intelligence. Because it's not just the impulses of emotions, it's guided emotions. It's emotions that have matured to the point where you actually feel for another and you sense the, 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 the antithesis to emotional intelligence is, yes, there's narcissism in a way. Not the only antithesis, but one of them. Because it's not about the other person. Emotional intelligence means that even if on paper you may be right, emotional intelligence will tell you, you know what, it's not always about being right. It's about what will work. It's not about winning. It's about by creating happiness. In a game of chess or other sports, there it's all about winning, losing. Emotional intelligence tells the mind it's not just about who's right and who's wrong. Sometimes your child may be wrong, but they need your sensitivity. They need your empathy. They need your care. Sometimes your friend may be wrong, but they're in a sensitive place. They're in a vulnerable place. Emotional intelligence is able to go to that area. So it opens up a whole nother vista and new horizons of experience. No good, in, no good sustainable relationship can exist without some emotional intelligence. Another thing about emotional intelligence is that it's not intelligent in the same context like an equation, like an intelligent theory, an intellectual concept. It's a combination of intelligence, but also sensitivity, intuition, as I mentioned, and other factors that are not quite tangible. Just, just like sensing something. You sense someone sitting at your table, you're a host, and they're a little uncomfortable. Your mind will tell you there's no reason for them to be uncomfortable. Everyone's having a good time. The emotional intelligence will tell you maybe they're going through something difficult. Maybe there is something going on they're picking up and others are not picking up. It's almost like the sixth sense of something that can't always be quantified. And that's why someone who's really working just on paper will say, well, on paper it doesn't make sense. But the emotional intelligent person will say it's not about paper. It's not at words. It's not ideas. Someone comes to you, they're crying and they're in pain. And you could say, there's nothing to be in pain about. But I'm in pain, I feel something. And if you don't show care and concern, and you just say, you'll get over it, or everyone gets over it, you've not been purely emotional intelligent there. So it adds a whole dimension what we will call relationships, experiences. And unfortunately, there are many people, I've met many, that are brilliant up here, but they don't have the full development of their, of experiential, of an experiential level. Often it's out of fear. Not everyone will admit that, but often if you grew up in a home or an environment that abandoned you in some way, where you did not feel secure, where you did not feel nurtured and validated, you will escape often behind your mind and find excuses, and a good mind can cover its tracks and always cover everything up. But in truth, it's just a scared child that's living in an adult body. And if you have a good mind, you also have an extra tool that can cover up and make believe, oh, look, like, like an adult. Like that story with that person who was blind, but so trained themselves, no one could tell. Because they knew every inch of their home. So they were able to uh, per perform. For some situations, that may work. 
But in real relationship, that doesn't work. You can't fake it. So it is really about getting beyond our fears and our concerns, and often deeply embedded ones, to get to an emotional intelligent place. Can you argue that some people are just wired with it and some are not? Well, listen, like anything, there's nurture and nature. We all have parts of our lives that are, we're born that way, but as we see, things can be developed, things can be nurtured, things can be trained and harnessed. Just like a tree that's growing in a garden, if it's growing a little different direction, you could do certain things. I'm not saying change a tire personality, but you can direct, you can, as I said, harness, you can guide it, you can um, accentuate its strengths and somewhat minimize and uh, mitigate its weaknesses. But I would believe, like to say that it's not just the way we're wired. There's no question, just as people have natural higher IQ or natural intelligence, intelligent intelligence, they, some people have more emotional intelligence just the way they are. Maybe it's the way they grew up, family, they learned from others, they had role models. But there are things we all can do. And it begins with what I've always mentioned, the point of bittel, that word from Hasidic terminology. It's a very powerful word, very hard to translate. It's a combination of modesty, humility, but above all, suspending yourself in the face of another. Now here's the interesting thing. The mind does that naturally. A good, healthy mind detaches its own prejudices and its own biases and self-interest from the concept. I'm not talking about a biased mind or someone who's bribed or somebody who's... uh, under the influence of some self-interest. But the way the mind works, well, but the mind can train the emotions, who naturally are not that way, because emotions react, is it good for me or not? Emotions are very impulsive and reflexive in that sense. But the mind can train the emotions to also have that element of restraint. And that's not changing their personality. It's just training them to have that bittle. And when you do that, that's when you have the best of both worlds. Because to have it only on the reflective mind, but your emotions still remain little immature emotions that you're just simply controlling and dominating over and posing over is one thing. But to actually get the emotions developed to a point that the emotions and the mind can work together. And the emotions can say, and the mind can say to the emotions, it's not all about you. Yes, we need your empathy, we need your feelings, we need your engagement, we need you in the relationship. But it's not all about you. That's when you have, in the language of the Hasidic masters, the bittel of chachma, of koyachma, the selflessness, the suspension of self to absorb something greater than yourself, being transferred to the emotions. And then your emotions have both strengths. The feeling, the empathy, which engages, and on one hand is very subjective, but also that selflessness. And that's the ultimate emotional intelligence. That's why you'll see the people who reach that level are both brilliant in their minds, but even more brilliant in their feelings. I remember once hearing a story, Chassid, his name was Rab Mendel Chain, and he was having a discussion with the great Rab Chaim of Brisk, one of the greatest sages in the previous, uh, the 19th, 20th century, 19th century. And they were talking about a, a Rambam. Rambam is Maimonides. They were discussing an intricate and complex a legal issue. And Rabbi Mendel Chaim says to Rabbi Chaim that what you just said is a Maimonides, there's a Rambam that disagrees with what you just said. Rabbi Chaim looks at him and says, no, there's no such Rambam. He says, yes, there is. Rav Chaim says, listen, this is the domain of Brisk, where we come from, we, we know our Rambams. Amendel Chain, he went out of the room, came back, humbly, opened the Ram, a Rambam, put it on the desk, and left the room. Rav Chaim looked at the Rambam, the Maimonides, and said, yeah, he's right. I missed this Rambam. Rav Mendel was right. Later, when Rav Chaim was recounting the story to his colleague, the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Chabad Rebbe, they were friends, and Rav Mendel was a chassid of the Rebbe Rashab. He said that, he says these words, he said that Rav Mendel was a gone, a genius, a scholar in Rambam. I'm not surprised at that. But that he's a gone, he's a scholar, he's a genius in Midas Tevis. Which means 
in his gentleness, in his kindness, in his graciousness, that I was not aware of. The fact that he walked out of the room, he didn't want to be there, he didn't want to say, hey, you see, I, saw, I have the Ramba. That's emotional intelligence combined with intellectual intelligence. The sensitivity that do not lose your humanity. Not only don't lose it, become an even more refined person. Because at the end of the day, if the mind doesn't help the emotions become more refined and not just follow their own impulses, it's not really achieved its goal. So to say the mind is great, but my emotions, well, you know what? They haven't caught up yet. No, the goal is that the emotions should be guided by the maturity of the mind, that the emotions also mature to be more refined, kinder, gentler, more sensitive, more empathetic. Conclude, Bertrand Russell and Maimonides. Let's contrast them. Bertrand Russell once was found doing something very unethical, having a relationship with a student. And the, the, at Cambridge, where he was teaching, they called him in, the faculty, and said, you're a professor of ethics. How could you behave in an unethical way? He says, listen, I'm also a professor of mathematics, and I'm not a triangle. That was his response. What I do and what I teach is not necessarily consistent. Maimonides writes in his classic magnum opus, you want to know who a wise person is? Don't look at their intelligence, at their oratory skills, at their brilliance, at their ability to argument, to present a great argument, their IQ. You want to know who a wise person is? Look how they talk to others, how they walk, how they eat, how they sleep. The practical, simple things. And that's where you see the true wisdom shine. So it's not a compartmentalization where we're a mind here and your emotions and behavior is over there. There's a consistency. Are we, will we be perfect? Obviously not. But it's a standard. Unfortunately, in the scientific world, sometimes they actually pride themselves. Hey, don't look at what I do. I'm brilliant in my mind. They disconnect the mind from, beha from behavior and from emotions. The ultimate goal is not just controlling the impulses, but refining the emotions. And there you have the ultimate emotional intelligence working with intellectual intelligence. And you see it the most blatant way. The litmus test is in relationships. Intimate relationships, personal relationships between man and woman, between spouses, between parents and children, the areas where we are not just relying on our minds and an anal analytics and analysis and cerebral, um, cerebral activity, but in the relationship area. And you have the capacity to reach there. Don't buy into the narrative that, no, you develop your mind, the emotions will either go along or just ignore them or they'll just do their thing. No, the emotions are there like a garden, the mind is like a gardener. The emotions are the flowers. And you can make those flowers grow and blossom and become far greater when they, what they, than what they were in their earlier stages, more immature stages. So there you have, hopefully I did some justice to this important topic, emotional intelligence, that um, we can apply to our personal lives. And with that, I'd like to conclude by giving you all a blessing that may you grow both with your minds but above all in your emotions this has been simon jacobson meaningful life center meaningfullife.com where you can find this and many other programs i'd love to hear your feedback your thoughts your comments your questions and above all please share this with others again meaningfullife.com be blessed and i look forward to see you again soon this program is brought to you by the Meaningful Life Center. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at MeaningfulLife.com donate.